Welcome to episode 65 of the Hoops Fix podcast with me, your host, Sam Nita, full-time British basketball advocate. And on this week's show, we have an innovator in the game. He runs the London United program. He goes by the name Jack Majewski. I might have butchered his pronunciation. I did ask for it. A lot of people pronounce it Jack Majewski or Jack Majewski. Um, but he's Polish and it's actually pronounced Majewski. Um, and this is a guy who was actually, well, he ran Future Stars International Tournament. Originally was how I first came across him. It was the first tournament, one of the first tournaments that I ever covered uh, back in 2009. But it was a pretty prestigious under 18 international tournament that took place in, in Kingston at the time uh, and since then has done a bunch of different things uh, most recently he's just announced a partnership between his club London United and uh, movie star Estudiantes in Spain and has a very Eurocentric international um, view of basketball and he sort of brings that experience into the British game and and there's a, there's a lot of interesting things that you have to say, uh, which I think is a little bit contrary compared to a lot of the general sentiment we hear from from other people that are perhaps British and stuck in our own our own way of thinking. So it was a super interesting conversation. Got into a bunch of different stuff around the state of the game and how to drive uh, the development of the game, the importance of clubs, the importance of exposure to European competition. So I think it's a, a conversation. That if you're interested in the sort of the state of British basketball and the, the potential growth of British basketball, uh, it's one that you will thoroughly enjoy, uh, like I did. As always, before we get into the show, please take two seconds to check out our Patreon account. That's patreon.com forward slash hoopsfix. P a t r e o n dot com forward slash h w o p s f i x. There you can sign up to give us a monthly contribution of as much or as little as you'd like to help us do the work that we're doing. We're not asking for a lot of money, literally talking about a couple of dollars a month, or obviously give more than that if you want to do that. Um, but it allows us to become more independent, more sustainable, more financially viable to help us continue doing what we're doing and hopefully uh, grow it way beyond what we're currently doing at the moment. If you're listening on iTunes, please take two seconds to give us a rating and review. Open up your podcast player. Uh, go into Hoops Fix Podcast. You can take two seconds to give us five seconds, uh, five star and a uh, rating. It'd be much appreciated. Uh, and as always, if you're, if you're watching on YouTube as well, uh, you can leave a comment below and let me know your thoughts and we can get some uh, conversation going. You can also reach out to me on every single social media platform. At Hoops Fix, there's a lot of call to actions. I think I might have to start reducing these. Uh, and you can reach out to me privately on my email address. If you prefer one-on-one -on -one conversation, sam at hoopsfix.com. And there I'll reply to every single one and we can get in a discussion about anything you like. So yeah, that is enough from me. Uh, here is this week's episode of the Hoops Fix podcast with me and Jack Majewski. Jack, welcome to the show. Welcome. Pleasure to be. Pleasure to talk to you. So yeah, there's a ton of stuff uh, to go into, but I think the obvious place is kind of like you're obviously not from England. Uh, how did you end up here in the first place? What made you? What made you come to the UK? <laughs> well, because it was uh, such a long time ago. Uh, actually, my entire life revolved around basketball. I don't know for what reason my father was a professional footballer and for some reason I got involved in basketball. I wasn't a particularly great player myself, but I played at a very big program in Poland, Wisla Kraków, spent entire entire junior years there. Being a, being a player there, of course, the program was so so big that I had no chance to 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 be a pro on this program. And as soon as uh, I started university and I started uh, uh, finish uh, junior years, I, I I moved to the Division Two club in Poland. Been there for just one year. Actually, I was typical 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 case of. You know, short guy who was good under 16. I even made the Polish uh, national team for under 16. But them gradually worse, worse, worse. And you know, absolutely no chance to be a professional. I've seen the professional players at Wisla. Krakow, there was massive, massive program with uh, super successful um, uh, women's, men's volleyball. You know, all sorts of sports, obviously football. So no, 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 no chance for me. For people like me, I went to Division One. And as a matter of fact. I, uh, I was just about to, I was studying, I was doing, uh, I was studying at the University of Academy of Physical Education, doing my master's there. And, 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 and uh, I was just about to stop playing in Division 2. And would you believe it, Wisla Krakow came back to me to ask, look, we want you back, but not as a player, obviously, but we want you to coach. 
and 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 actually that, that changed my life because because obviously in the age of 21 I started coaching almost full time. I had to combine that with studies, uh, with studies, which was which was obviously in Eastern Europe and in Europe, which is still like that. Coaching is absolutely full time, full time, full time uh, situation. Actually, I was making more money than, than my father, which I was pretty chuffed about, you know, <laughs> studying, coaching, you know. Uh, and and, and that gradually became my life. Uh, things went very good for me because I spent time with Wisla three years. And then the last year, I started working for Polish Federation with Polish under-16 national team. Uh, Probably from the perspective of time, in the hindsight, I would say it was too early because I was 23, 24 when I was working with people who were 16, was only eight years behind uh, between us. So maybe, maybe uh, I shouldn't have taken this job, but wow, you know, then, you know, you're 22, 23, you're big headed as hell. And, you know, someone offers you to work with Federation, of course, I, I jumped to it. And actually that coincided with my my last year at the university when I was graduating doing my master's. I've done master's and uh, I decided that I met my wife. Uh, we we were from the same, 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 same academy. And, you know, that was uh, time in Poland, early 90s, where, you know, if you were not going abroad, and that applies to entire Eastern Europe, when you were not going abroad and trying to get a job, job abroad you know you were doing something strange and and uh, i thought to myself no i want to go abroad but i don't want to be and that's you know there's almost prehistoric times early 90s Pol poland didn't even think about being member of eu or or nothing nothing like that uh, there was the times of visa work permits and things like that and 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 uh, we said no we're going abroad uh, both of us but we came up with ingenious plan that, you know, we want to go abroad, work abroad, but I don't want to work in, in restaurants and, you know, and uh, building sites and things like that. I thought that I, no matter what, I have to kill myself and get a job somewhere abroad. Uh, since I knew only, in, uh, well, uh, we thought that would be good to, to go to England, actually without any practical reason behind it, apart from the fact that I thought that maybe it would be easier to get a job. Came on student visa, started uh, uh, spend the time learning uh, language, uh, learning English, uh, studying English, trying to uh, get all sorts of jobs. Obviously, uh, before I got the basketball uh, situation, wrote CV for every single club in Scotland, Ireland, uh, God knows where. Uh, after after trying and trying, I got a job in <laughs> in Edinburgh, out of all places. Where uh, and I was so chuffed. I thought, like, my God, I'm, I'm, I'm finally I get a work permit here. I'll be working here. And literally a week later came answer from the team, which, the only team which I heard about, uh, Guildford Kings. And Guildford Kings uh, said, Well, we would we would like to talk to you. Obviously, you cannot be a head coach, but we can we can do something for you. And this something was was meeting Kevin Cadel and those great experience. Uh, they got me first work permit, which, which in current terms it's 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 difficult to explain. But you know, moving from communist country early nineties when you know Polish people needed a visa a work permit, probably I was the only Pole working here legally apart from ambassador and myself mm -hmm. probably. I didn't know the ambassador, but you know, all of a sudden you know I. I we had we had hellish six weeks with my uh, six months with my wife trying to you know to, to 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 combine work, all crazy type of work, studying and writing the CVs, obviously pre internet times, so you sending those CVs, and then work out for us. And I started my first um, proper job, legal job, in basketball with was with 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 Guilford Kings and and Kevin Cadel. And that was, as a matter of fact, I will stay always eternally grateful to to these people, um, Barry Doe, Martin Clark, who owned the owned the Guildford Kings, and 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 obviously Kevin himself. 
And it was absolutely a surreal trip because could you imagine from communist country and I grew up in communist country. I had great childhood, great, 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 great memories. But, you know, you're growing up in the country where, you know, for some inexplicable re reason in every shop you've got a vinegar, you know, sports shops sell vinegar, you know, everyone sells vinegar. No, no how is that? But that was the only which, item which was available in every, every Polish shops. To the situation where all of a sudden the first year in Guildford we we qualified qualified to top 16 in Europe, and 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 the, as a matter of fact, a funny story the team which was the um, team which we had to beat to qualify to final 16 was Hapoel Hapoel Gali Elion from um, from Israel. Maybe not, nothing remarkable about Hapoel Galielion, but the coach of Galielion was David Blatt. And that's how I first met David Blatt first time. I'm sure they, I'm not sure. I know for a fact that David Blatt was well pissed off that he lost to English team from <clears throat> playing from the Laser Center. But here we go. We qualified to top 16. That's, that's how I end up in England. And, 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 and you know, again, you know, against the political background, you know, entire Eastern Europe, the fall of um, Berlin Wall, entire Eastern Europe was on the movement. That's why I got so so much sentiment to to ex Yugoslavian players, ex Russian players, because all of us, all of us were in the same. They were great players. I was nobody in the terms of basketball compared to them, but all of us were in the same situation, trying to desperately to find the place to live and fighting for for being accepted fighting for um, proving to everyone that we can work abroad, we can legally work abroad and contribute. And that was, that was, that was, uh, I was very, I'm very fond of these memories. There were crazy times requiring crazy actions, but um, there was very, 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 I would say character building. And, you know, and, uh, what was your knowledge of uh, English basketball before coming over here? Like was it a uh, surprise? Was it a surprise to you that all of a sudden you're playing, you're you're working for a team that has got to the last sixteen in Europe, or or was it partly expected? Like, what was your knowledge before coming over? Here? Oh my god! Oh my god! You you started me me right now. So uh, obviously in Poland uh, in Poland um, uh, actually I was uh, I was quite obsessed uh, with coaching. Coaching was always my passion, and you know I was uh, dri uh, driving my father uh, to absolute uh, kind of crazy state of craziness because I was telling everyone that I would be coach of Barcelona and, and Barcelona was my obsession. So I wanted to coach Barcelona, ne never coach Barcelona, but uh, we'll get to it. Uh, but uh, my uh, obviously I was reading everything about um, about uh, basketball, about uh, European competition. As a matter of fact, my, my final dissertation at the University of Academy of Physical Education, my master's is, uh, dissertation, was based on a European competition, which Polish team Lech Poznań qualified. They played top eight of uh, European competition. There was old teams where Bob McAdoo played, where... Um, Pierre Luigi Marsorati played, and I had a kind of part of my dissertation. I interview all those guys. I run the interviews with them. To Volkov was there um, as well. So I run the interview, asking them, Jesus Christ, they, they must have hated that because entire dissertation was based on aspects of rebounding. So I talked to them. Instead, you know, I, they were kind enough to talk to me, some goofy guy from Poland comes to them and ask them about how important is rebounding and what aspect affect the rebounding. But they, they were very kind to me. They talked to me about it. So I always wanted to be coach. And I follow very closely, very closely what was going in Europe. And I was fascinated, fascinated by the old um, uh, Kingston team. Kingston. I knew about Kingston. The only thing which I knew about is um, was Kingston team. And I, I, by the way, uh, we, that's, we, we're going a bit of the track, but I think the story of Kingston in Europe, in time before I came with Kevin Cadell, is the greatest untold story, or one of the greatest untold, untold stories of, of, of European basketball that should be done by 30 for 30 by ESPN or something like that. Because but imagine the team I fought from Poland, you know, England for us was like 
different planet, different world. So we thought that they playing in a huge venue. We don't know they have huge money behind it, huge sponsorships, huge junior programs. The Americans are millionaires and everything. Here we go. They play from the tall wolf lasers that are even worse than the game. And could you imagine? Could you imagine to qualify? That's why I said that maybe we can do it together. You know? Could you imagine that to go to Europe? And we're talking about them being very successful. When we qualified to top 16, we lost every single game and went bankrupt. Yeah. But they, <laughs> they didn't go bankrupt. They were one game away from qualifying to final four, could you imagine? And they were doing that from, to, uh, first of all, they qualified uh, there by beating Dynamo Moscow. Dynamo Moscow, one of the superpowers which we Poles were afraid, got beaten in girls' school in Tolworth. Tolworth was nothing else, it was girls' school. So they lost in the girls' school in, in Tolworth. Dynamo, they went to fi uh, final, uh, final competition, one game away from Final Four. This game happened to be against all Yugoplastica, which dominates entire Europe for three years. Team of Kuko, Jurajia just won with the last shot against them. So the, the phenomenal story. Obviously, from Polish perspective, because I was in Poland, I read the stories, and for me to be uh, close to, Gil to Kingston, it was like, I don't know, normal today's terms, traveling to Mars or something like that. So I was dreaming about this, you know, I'm 19, 22 years old boy, dreaming about this Kingston and having completely different impression of what it is. Then I came to England and I realized that Kingston, first of all, doesn't exist because they want to move to, 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 to Guildford. Secondly, uh, they don't have a sports hall, they don't own nothing, and Kingston is just the name and, and people behind it. As a uh, as a matter of fact, there one of the managers was the uh, lady who was age 65, who had nothing to do with the basketball. He, she just happened to be, live across the dual carriageway from Tolworth, and she was introduced to basketball by the virtue of the fact that she was looking after Latoya, Cadel, uh, daughter of Kevin Cadel. So that was the that was the reality. So for me, it was absolute shock. I you know my Polish impression of. European basketball, uh, co uh, you know, confronted with the reality was was huge shock. But but I thought, oh, what the hell? I mean, I'm just you know, I pay my own money. I actually, literally, I had to because Guildford uh, Kings were in such a horrendous situation that the payments were always late. Players didn't travel to away games because people like Alton Bert then had the gigs on television. So when they had a gig on television, they had to stay to the gigs, not to travel with us. That was crazy. That was absolutely crazy. People from Poland ringing me, talking to me, Jack, uh, well, how it is? Are you a millionaire already? I said, Jesus Christ, what are you talking about? I don't know what I'm eating tomorrow. So, 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 so great, great experience, fantastic experience to, you know, to, to kind of entertain you even more. Uh, ah, that's a good story. Uh, we traveled to Leverkusen, and Bayern Leverkusen was a very, very strong team. Actually, Bayern Leverkusen at that time was the backbone of German national team, which won the championship in 93 with Pesic, yeah? So people like Harnish, Feld were playing in Bayern Leverkusen. So we're playing for this Bayern Leverkusen, Again, it's by Leverkusen. We're in Leverkusen in hotel. And because um, I was traveling with this team, it was a big story in Poland. I was working for Guildford. So I had a contract with one of the major Polish sports paper to interview people. And that I really, really enjoyed speaking to these people. I interviewed Sabonis, Roy Tarpley, masses of the players. Whoever we play against, I always was doing the interview for this Polish paper tempo. Well, uh, I'm uh, just about to interview Christian Welp, who then was a big German player playing in NBA. He agreed to speak, uh, well, we're just ready to speak. All of a sudden in my room, uh, the telephone rings. Kevin Cade, Jack, you know, I need to speak to you. So uh, I thought like, about the game, we'll, we'll, let's talk. How, how they, I said, nah, listen, I don't know how to, how to tell you, but uh, European... Uh, uh, federation will punish us if we don't have a 10 players dress on the warm-up dress dress and 
come as a player on the warm up. So I said, I'm crazy. I said, like, no, 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 you have to do it. Put the uniform on, on. you will be a player. <laughs> So the entire I was so embarrassed this entire interview with Velp gone. I thought no, 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 I need to do that. So I had to run as a player. There was a lot of lot of funny stories there. <laughs> Unbelievable. I, I was gonna say, um you know, obviously from from the moment you you know, you came to you came to England, uh you were exposed to sort of European competition. You're obviously very interested in in European competition. It seems to have been a common thread over the entire time that you've been in the UK. And something I've I've heard you say, you know, a lot of times over the years, is just how well almost insular British basketball is, and the need for exposure to European basketball for for the game to grow. Can you kind of, I guess, articulate your thoughts around the importance of British? teams, players being exposed to European competition, why it's so important and why you think that it's not happening more? Well, th- that could be last question of this interview because we can go forever. You know, this saying how uh, how insular it is and where is the need to be a part of European, uh, not European, international scene, international scene. The, the, the world is b- by long shot. We, we need to expand uh, greatly, you know, this. Look at the Real Madrid. They've got the free Argentinian players. Well, we're not looking at, into European and very important Argentinian players. So uh, uh, it's pointing to the obvious, you know, you cannot grow the sport without international, international contacts. Uh, that's, that's the greatest edu- educator, uh, cont- interacting with other coaching philosophies, other uh, coaches, uh, interaction with far more competitive basketball, uh, far better organized basketball. That's that's huge stimulant. That's something which should work as, as a catalyst to, 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 to improve the game, both in terms of sporting-wise, commercially, in terms of uh, media exposure. Without that, you've got a, a cottage industry, you've got something very small. And uh, I'm glad that you pointed to that, you know, that's why, as a matter of fact, before, that, that, that's the reason why we organize Future Stars, that's why we're spending so much time on, on Future Stars, bringing top teams here. Uh, that's why we were the first team in England playing in EYBL. International competition is some. It is something very stimulating to see younger guys being like uh, goofy, clueless kids in the first trip. Then in the end of EYBL, uh, uh, you know, season you've got this almost seasoned veterans who are far more at place. At, at uh, everywhere in Europe, and uh, I think I think there's not only sporting um, a sporting aspect. There is this huge cultural aspect. These people are far broaden uh, with the broadened horizons. They're much easier to coach. They're much easier to coach. But I tell you, I tell you a great stories, a story about that, and you know how. But that was also t- a teaching experience for me. Teaching experience for me because how I said uh, I came from this coaching Polish even Polish under 16 uh, national team and in Poland we had uh, plenty of preconceptions you cannot be Yugoslavians you cannot be Russians you don't even have a conversation about Americans so these complexes were every, everywhere and uh, in terms of uh, actually. After after uh, um, Guilford Kings, the team went bankrupt. Kevin Cadell asked me whether I want to go with him to um, Towers, London Towers, because there was the creation of London Towers. I very kindly um, uh, declined this offer because me being myself and still being big-headed, I thought, no, no, I want to do something for myself. And we we came up with idea with idea of creating this um, actually uh, local government. At, uh, there was a time when gov- local government was far more involved. At Ealing, they said, "Look, um, we, uh, I set up the program in Chessington. I do apologize, Chessington for a moment. That was very successful. I want to do it on my own. And then I moved to Ealing, Ealing because we bought our first uh, uh, flat. We were absolutely chuffed, you know." about that first flat, first property in England. And um, we moved to Ealing, Ealing in London. And actually, even in, in Chessington, we had a lot, a lot of London-based players. There was very strong, uh, strong program. Uh, so when I moved to Ealing and uh, we created things, something which was called 
dealing tornadoes, which uh, and then then I went through absolutely crazy situation. I said, look, no matter what, we have to prove ourselves. We have to prove ourselves. I there was a fantastic program at Hackney connected to London Towers uh, with Joe White, who was a phenomenal, phenomenal character and phenomenal coach. Uh, English basketball is at great loss that that that. Um, Joe White uh, passed away. Ph phenomenal character. Uh, English basketball more needs more Joe Whites, and they they were beat, beating, uh, beating everyone. And uh, the junior program was absolute revelation for me because I thought to myself, okay, I see this European players. I see Polish. We play against a lot of European competitions in, um, teams in Poland. But then all of a sudden, I've seen young uh, Andrew Sullivan, and I thought, wow. What are we getting excited in Europe? Here is some monster who plays in school and is ten times better. He's like Kirilenko. He he was at that level of of talent actually. Young uh, Sullivan was talent wise seen as a very close to Kirilenko. So and there was not only Sullivan. There was a bunch of other super athletic kids with Joe Whitehead at Hackney. And when I came to Ealing, I thought like, no, 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 we have to do something. To, to be able to compete with these kids. So, uh, yes, I can get ultra-athletic kids from um, from West London, but I have to have different, some different, something different. I need to teach them faster to be at this level. And at that time, uh, that it was, as it was like one of the most important part of experiences in my entire life, which deeply affected me in terms of approach to life, approach to business, approach to sport, was traveling with these young kids to the tournament in Douai, in France. In junior basketball, there were, at that time, were two major tournaments, Albert Schweizer in uh, Mannheim, in Germany, which still exists, and Douai in France, like a little sleepy town in, in northern France. Actually, to, 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 to uh, be, mean anything in junior basketball at that time, you had to travel to one of these tournaments and 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 do something to 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 give you the scale of players. With, when I was traveling with the players to Due, we met teams with Tony Parker, Ronnie Turiaf, <laughs> Kevin Durant, Carmelo Anthony, Kirilenko was there. Mega mega players. So by some you know plugging uh, using my connection or uh, whatever, we got invited to this tournament. And we've done well in the first one, so they invited us a second time. And we had a, like a, a kind of not an English national team, but all-star team there. Luel Deng traveled with us, yeah? And just three before Luel Deng, Luel was fantastic, fantastic. Guy. And there was like, we traveling. And that's, that's really, let me look at the English player in a completely different way. It's, it's a funny story. I'm sure he will appreciate that uh, because I'm not talking behind his back. There was one of our players who went to have a very decent career. Uh, maybe we shouldn't mention his name. He played in Greece. So player X. So I don't know. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Player X. We traveling by minibus and you know to to break the boredom. I said to play uh, player X. Uh, Listen X. Uh, that would be interesting. We've got America, someone else, and Croatia in our group. That would be very difficult difficult game. And a difficult situation. And he, he looks at me like, there is no such a country like Croatia. Like, well, there is a country like Croatia that's uh, Koko, Radja, Petrovic are from them. And he looked at me, nah, there's no such a country. Jesus Christ. So we are really in trouble here. Uh, uh, opposite, we're not that strong team, and on top of it, our kids are crazy as well. But okay, we arrive, arrive to this to where. We uh, Croatia, uh, we started next day, but Croatia was already playing that. And this is the warm up for uh, Croatian team for, before the game. Croatia is there, so I called this player X to say to him, "Look, this is Croatia." Well, he true to his form says, "Nah, there's a bunch of white stiffs who will beat them." But at that time, I'm really petrified because I think, like, listen, this is Croatia, Croatian national team. They will kill us. Well, here we go. Next day. This player X scored 27 points, and we beat this Croatia. And for me, it was something which really deeply affected me. I thought, Jesus Christ, we supposedly, after the university, having masters, 
with all these preconceptions, we much we so wrong compared to some goofy kid by the name of X who came without any complexes, without any preconceptions. He didn't see this Croatia or Russia or whatever. He didn't even know that they exist. He just put 27 points on them and scored. And that made me think like, Jesus Christ, if you put this talent into right frames, this uh, England would have a program comparable with old Yugoslavia, France, the talent is beyond comprehension. Situation that you pick up the kid literally on the street and after six months of coaching, you get them into EYPL or European competition is unthinkable in other countries. So going back to your initial question, question, I think with the talent which exists here, we, if you put that in the right frame, both in terms of organization, coaching, and exposing them, because these kids are immensely talented, and it's almost like black hole. They disappear or going to completely minor programs in the after age of 19. Trips to America don't help them that much. Uh, other countries don't send their best player to America, as a matter of fact. For some English kids, this, this, this is maybe a good answer, but that cannot be answered for building the program. So from beginning, from this fateful trip to Douai, I was thinking like, Jesus Christ, if you put them in the right frames, provide them with right consistent coaching and a right opportunity, correct opportunities to to go somewhere and um, continue professional career, that's in terms of talent. This is not worse than France. What players, what exposure French players got, what players, exposure English players got. Do you, do you think that... Um... Well, one of the other things, kind of in the, in our conversations, sort of before this conversation, uh, is you're talking about the the role and the importance of clubs, and I, and I found that quite a compelling uh, thing that you said uh, in terms of. I, I feel like one of the, the thought processes that I've had over the years is that actually um, in England, I've gen generally felt, and I feel like this is changing more recently, but generally I felt like the actual the federation needs to take more central control. Uh, because there isn't any alignment in kind of what everyone's doing. Everyone, there's just like little pockets of goodness, and there's other pockets of just what's going on here. And so I've always felt like actually, if they took more central control, and you know, whether it's a French model of like an inset, inset when you're talking about the pathway and having sort of dedicated regional performance centres or, or something like that. But actually, one of the things you said was was that you know there isn't a country where the federation is the driver of the economic growth of the sport. It's always down to the strength of the clubs. Can you kind of, I guess, talk about your, your thought process around there and, and I guess where, you know, from your view, looking at England, where the clubs are going wrong or, or, or why we haven't got more sort of strong, thriving clubs? Well, I think it's the, uh, it's the concept, uh, is a complex issue. But if we dissect that, it's complex, but I, I think... If we dissect that in the right order, it's very clear to see it. The concept that the clubs must be driving force behind everything is undeniable. That you, you, you cannot question that. You cannot question that. You know, you can say a lot of things about Euroleague, but their mantra is clubs, 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 exposure of the clubs. Same NBA, same every other successful organization. Uh, Let's park basketball for a second. English football is not phenomenally successful commercially and sporting-wise. And sporting wise. And yeah, some people laugh and say, no, they're not as successful as they should be. They are very successful sporting-wise. You know, last, last season, Champions League and Europa Cup was played by four English teams. It is because the teams are strong. People don't get excited about federation and some superstar working for the federation. People do get excited about very strong football club. That's and conversely about uh, about uh, about any sporting clubs. That they are the organization which provides sport on daily basis, day in day out. They coach every weekend. They should gather. Um, and gather uh, supporters, 
to, to watch the game, fans to watch the game. And that's how you build strong clubs, strong commercially clubs are the backbone of every sport. Clubs might, must have a place in society, must be in community, in society as well, must have an opportunity to grow, to attract the sponsors, to be seen as a valid, viable commercial organization. I thought, now jump to second part. I totally agree with what you just said. The English, uh, England basketball as a federation cannot be seen. And I agree with it. I and completely disagree with the, uh, uh, actually I dislike them very much, uh, voices that no um, funding should go to England Basketball Federation and and that's uh, we complain all the time that it's not funded by the government. No, it shouldn't be funded. It shouldn't be funded. Stop crying about not get, getting government funds. That's that's actually that's very detrimental because that makes impression of sport of basketball as a begging uh, institution. That no no no, we should create situation when we attract the money, where we, we, I mean, we as a club attract the money to, to, to grow our business. When Bask England basketball, and that's not their fault that they're not getting money, because in the first place, I don't think they should get the money because there is no example in the entire world when growth of the sport is just generated from the federation. Clubs, should, where basketball, I think England basketball uh, is failing its role, is they're not creating, you said they're taking more centralized role, but I disagree with that. I disagree with that because what the biggest role of each federation is to create environment when sports can grow, grow and develop. That's the best, create environment where sports can grow allow us, we living in immensely rich country, immensely entrepreneurial country. Through the history, there is no other country which produced so many innovative uh, entrepreneurial things. So, but the, why is there is no investment in basketball? For a very simple reason. Why would you invest into the clubs, inverted comma clubs, where clubs, They've got no rights to the players. They've got no facility, their own facilities, and they cannot get, generate their own or own income. For sake of argument, how would you go to any kind of business? And let's face it, if you talk to right people asking for 100, 200,000 pounds, it's not a big deal. But the first question is, Jack, okay, fine, good idea. But what do you really own? You don't have as facilities. Not good. What about the players? Can we do something with the players? Well, not really. These players, for some inexplicable reason, can call me tomorrow and say, no, you know, Jack, we don't like it. We're going tomorrow. We're going somewhere else. And that it's impossible to create anything stable and grow any kind of business in such a moving environment. There's not even building, building on sand. It's building on water. You, no one will invest into anything, anything, where uh, where is so many situations so unstable? And I'm amazed, I'm amazed that in England, England is the only country where players can move within, actually not even by the end of the season, within eight days, players can go. So why, what incentive for club, what there is, what's their incentive for clubs to invest into coaching? It's better to coach the players, talk to them, they come to you anyway. So there is absolutely no invest in, uh, in, uh, incentive to invest into coaching, into uh, building young players who can go somewhere. Clubs, players should be registered to the club almost for life, and the only transfers should be allowed in situations where, for instance, a particular club doesn't have this age category, or 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 uh, players, uh, both clubs exist to, uh, to to move the player. And it's very good financial model for that. Play, players would still pay, clubs would stay pay the license for their players, England basketball get the money. There should be some sensibly set up transfer uh, fee for the player between the clubs based on the time which uh, this particular player spent in each particular club. 
and that's that's that would stabilize the situation at least from the aspect, uh, con, uh, point of view that we will know that the clubs and players are some entity which last longer. Obviously, facility is another issue, but I wouldn't call it as an insurmountable situation. We've got a very good examples of uh, uh, Newcastle, fantastic example, very good example of Leicester when they build their own facility. And uh, I think that that should be done. And I think the clubs should think clubs which do have some asset in by, I don't want for lack of a better word, I would say for having, having their own players would be more stable, would be able to to talk to local authorities, to talk to other, actually that's what we're doing here, talk, talking to other sports which are in similar situation, we're talking to very strong volleyball club, to perhaps to build their own facilities. To build the facility is not, there's a lot of myths as well, it's not as expensive as a lot of people think. So, uh, first of all, I I think what you're saying that England basketball got to try to centralize. Yes, some movements are some moves that are very good. I, I love, for instance, what Brian is doing with his uh, program for uh, coaches uh, using Erasmus for that. That's yes, that's right. But we England without moving, making one drastic, the no, drastic no clear move. Players from X Y they X belong to these players and move to these to particular clubs and the movement of the players is only uh, permitted under uh, strict um, uh, regulations, which in basketball would make money out of this as well, because I'm sure this transfer fee, this small transfer fee, would be shared between clubs and, and the federation. That's how everyone, every other European federation uh, do, would allow to clubs to stabilize some of them, and then you see why people drift uh, from uh, from coaching, why people drift from investing into the clubs, because there is nothing stable there. You, people cannot see coaching as their profession, and that's how you're losing the best uh, the best talent. And there's plenty of people who would be deeply interested in coaching in this country, very knowledgeable people, who for obvious reason drift away. With it. From 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 the sport, from the profession, because reality, in some stage, sooner than later, rather, kicks in, and you know they cannot live with the money. No, they got a passion for sport, but they clearly see that 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 they cannot create a profession out of that. In that, in this, I see very detrimental uh, way of this approach, because by creating constant creation of the program of the sport, which belongs on handouts and belong, it depends on volunteers and sending clear, clear message. No, you cannot make profession out of that. Is is very, very, very weak on the verge of image of cottage industry instead of professional, mm-hmm. professional environment. It isn't part of, like I understand, I understand everything you're saying um, in terms of, you know, the clubs need to protect their investment if, if you're talking about players and stuff and to give Absolutely. them stability and stuff like that. But isn't it a chicken and egg situation where it's like, well, at the moment it's hard to essentially for a club to say they own a player when there's no money involved anyway, right? It's like you can't have contracts with all these junior players when there's really no revenues to assign, to, to, to allow you to have the money to be able to sign players like that, no? But no, I think we're clearly confusing uh, uh, confusing uh, the issues. Why for junior these junior players don't need to be co- uh, paid? These junior players need to uh, stay with the club, and uh, uh, very little, very few countries pay to junior players. No, no, no. I'm not saying about that paying those players. You don't need to pay junior players. Probably you junior players. Contract, then. Uh, contract uh, by, maybe this. Uh, like what would be the better word? License them with the club. License with the club. You don't need to pay them. You need to. They need to have a license with the club for duration of the junior careers. That's that's how it is in in every every European country, in Spain, Poland, wherever you go. You cannot change the club as, when you are a junior without the permission of federation and both clubs involved. But isn't what well, even if even if the club 
in, in those cases, you'd have to tell me because I, I don't actually know. But in those yeah, cases, yeah. Is, is the club not uh, providing whether it's accommodation or is it literally the club's just providing, no, they're just providing all. coaching sessions for the players and then they're licensed absolutely, to that club? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. For, for sake of argument, um, Krakow, well, let's work on... Uh, Serbian Serbian situation where you know you've got partisan. Actually, that applies to every single every single European country. If a player comes from X Y Z city and plays for the club for several for couple uh, couple years, yeah, clubs does not provide any accommodation, nothing like that. Provides coaching. He's a member of this club. He will not change the club. He will no. He won't go to different club either the same city or the same country, without the permission of the club which he, where he started his career and where he belongs to. And then, if the other clubs want to uh, get him, pays the fee, and these fees are very sensibly set, to the club which brought up this player to compensate for his coaching, which I think is absolutely right thing. This player being taught how to play in the original club. So the club which want to acquire him pay some form of fee to the uh, to the club which player comes from and fraction of this fee comes to the federation that's how how that operates otherwise otherwise i see zero point zero point on spending money on teaching uh, youngsters who can pick up and go tomorrow somewhere else why would you do that what 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 what, what incentive would you have to 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 teach the to teach these players to coach them and things like that? And that's set up everywhere like that. Player, you any good, decent any given player from Malaga program will not go to anywhere in in Spain without permission and uh, from the federation and without agreement between Malaga and the club which he goes to. And that applies to. Entire, entire Europe. Why are we yeah. allowing? I, I, I get that. Like, it, yeah, it, ma- it makes sense when when you put it like that. Uh, I do. Yeah, I do. I do see it from that point of view. I guess from from the player's point of view, though, if I'm a player, and mm. and I'm you know just started playing basketball with the club, and they've got me for their entire my entire junior career, but for whatever reason, I say that I'm I'm super unhappy and I want to move. But then they're like, well, no, we've invested in in you in developing you, and you're not allowed to you're not allowed to leave. Like, does that not like how how is a situation like that resolved? Because if the club's refusing to release you and you don't want to be there, what are you going to do? Well, I I, I think the, well the normal time normal thing which in Poland happens and as a matter of fact for Yugoslavia, such a player does not play for a year and then after a year he's free to go wherever he wants. Ah, uh, so a player would have to stay out for a year. But you see, you said that uh, this thing, and I understand your point, and 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 I w- I would love to uh, to be uh, I I really appreciate your situation to be devil's advocate, but sport it's by definition it's not very democratic uh, part of life. We cannot please everyone. Well, if he's unhappy, I don't know. As a matter of fact, and you know what? Probably it's not our job to know everything. And for some inexplicable reason, he is unhappy. I don't know, take a year break, go somewhere else. If he's unhappy for genuine reason, I'm sure strong, sensible club always can reach some form of agreement. But please don't tell me that uh, players in football... Can you imagine? Uh, but Sam, you asked me the situation. Uh, how how was the... What's the What's the system for academy players in football in this country? Are these guys, uh, guys get paid? Hell no. Hell no. They are part of academies. And if they want to move the academy, the new academy pays uh, compensation. We don't need to go abroad. This system exists exists everywhere where sports is taken professionally. English bas- English football would be would be the beacon of that. Have you, have you had discussions... With the federation here about about this, like proposing it and asking why it's not done. Listen, you know how many uh, this actually the fact that I'm gradually drifted uh, from away from basketball and got involved in other sport, building academies, and that's what interests me uh, very much in com- combination of uh, variety of sports that we do now: volleyball, boxing, basketball. 
is the fact that I had several conversations. And, and what perplexed me is that the concept is so simple. People do agree with that, and the current CEO agree with that, and current deputy head in England basketball agree with that. Yes, it's a good concept, we should think. And nothing happens. And, you know, and that's the part of it that at this moment, the picture of basketball is so unattract- unattractive, so stagnated that, you know, you can accuse media, and especially social media, about everything, that, but not about the fact that they are ready to pounce on every interesting story. And English basketball is so boring that no one really cares to write about it. So, you know, that's, that here is the stagnation and uh, lack of investment because everyone sees that as a very small uh, cottage industry. I keep using this expression of the cottage industry. There is, must be some point when we say England basketball and actually England basketball because we're talking about empowering the clubs. The, empowering the clubs must be stimulated, stimulated, that's probably a very good word, by circumstances created by England basketball. Rest is up to the clubs. Yeah. And uh, trust yeah. me, if this in this country there is the hundreds of young, older entrepreneurs who would say, oh, that's interesting, let's do something with that. Because, uh, because the uh, social aspect of that is very good. Perhaps God help us. Uh, financial aspect of that could be good. Maybe we can do some business out of that. So there will be a lot of people. The people are not jumping, including media, on the entire scene because it's so unstable and so unattractive at this moment to invest. Uh, that it's proof is in the pudding. There's no investment, and we uh, stop begging for uh, because we are begging for a couple millions here and there from uh, from the sports England. Couple millions here and there is peanuts to compare to what can be earned from uh, acting in the right environment. On one or two millions, you cannot go to Champions League. I, I don't, I'm sure we'll reach uh, uh, Vince going this year, which I think is a very good situation he goes. Polish club going into Champions League will expect club going into Champions League around 3 million euros to go to Champions League, to say nothing about Europe. So the the living in, that's, that's what really shocked me because we living in immensely rich country and in uber rich city in London. How on earth we will not create a situation which will be somehow conducive to doing business with really rich people is simply beyond me. And the fact that there's, there's, there's no investment is because these people you can accuse them of everything, but they are not stupid. They will not invest into something which is ridiculously, ridiculously unstable without any solid, solid foundation. Yeah, I mean, the, the proof in the pudding on the on the on the stability thing is you just look at how many how many franchises have been in the BBL over the last since its inception in you know over thirty years or whatever. It's uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's rare to find ones that, that sort of last the last the test of time. And, and actually, it would be interesting. Sorry, yeah, go on. But isn't that isn't that just a confirmation of of uh, what I? Just said, yeah, one hundred percent. BBL, which I spent two, 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 two independent period of time there, is completely inconducive to to running the business. It's a perfect way to waste the money, as in fact, because there is no model how we can earn. There's no in 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 that goes back to something where. Uh, which as we started conversation to invest in older players players from abroad, Americans who uh, are closer to my age than the than play, normal playing age. That's pointless. That's throwing, that's burning the money. Here it comes to this over, overriding philosophy, which perhaps England basketball should be part of creating, to saying, no, enough is enough. We will invest into young players. Uh, we don't have a, a lot of money. Every penny will be put intelligently into promotion and coaching of young players but that goes into employment of very up and coming coaches who and paying them for it saying maybe maybe our professional league should be based on we can afford to compete with on a regular basis with top of the europe at this point financially 
let's create this league into window of opportunity for young players. Well, let's England to be perfect, to be same version or like Belgium league. Do you know how many Americans, young Americans, sees Belgium as a league which doesn't pay that much, more than in England, but is perfect trampoline to go somewhere somewhere else in Europe. There's countless of really big time players who started their league in, in, in Belgium because there's exposure, there's very seen. You ask me how important is being part of European of um, seeing how important it is uh, for players, of course, even from exposure. Exposure is 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 a currency. You you can get amazingly good players who say, look, we'll pay you really peanuts here for a year or two, but guess, guess what? You will be exposed. You will play Real Madrid. You will play uh, top European clubs. You will be seen. That 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 that's the value in. And uh, that's uh, you know. So maybe maybe some philosophical change of overhauling entire BBL instead of, no, no, we'll be not paying veterans, we'll get young up-and-coming players and we'll try to expose them. But for it, you need to be the part of European competition, even the FIBA Cup, even yeah. FIBA Cup. Yeah. Would, would oh, you, you alluded to it, to it there and I, I didn't want to talk about it. Uh, it's obviously, like you said, you had two separate um, sort of dives into the, into the BBL with London United, which was around, was around 2006 and then obviously Surrey United, um, which was 2012, 2013, 2014, around then. Can you kind of, I guess, London United kind of, well, in fact, in both cases, I guess, kind of recap uh, your involvement sort of and what happened because, you know, both of them in, in both instances didn't end up panning out, I guess, how you envisaged it panning out. They both ended up being shorter term things. What were the issues? Um, what, were the, what were the struggles from your side? Uh, well, there are two, two different cases, two completely different cases. Uh, first venture was, uh, how you said, 2006, 2007, which, which we were actually, uh, we had a very strong Division One program, very strong Division One program. We were winning Division One senior, senior division, and that was very, very, Strong, uh, strong program based on very, very experienced players and a lot of youngsters. Stevr plays there, you know, people like that. So we always had a very strong nucleus of young players. We won this league, and we were effectively uh, invited by England, uh, by BBL to play there. And the, and that uh, actually, in this one I showed, I showed the naivety. Uh, I. There was a mistake. Uh, I believe uh, we were persuaded that because of Olympics um, kind of, uh, I'm looking for excitement. I, I do uh, personally want to avoid the word of hysteria. Uh, excitement. Mm -hmm. we, we spoke to a lot of people and uh, we were led to believe again, I'm saying I'm naive because I believed it. There'll be a lot of investment, but the problem is move to East London. And could you believe it? The idea was uh, let's move to East London, play the first game, um, first game uh, to the uh, first season in Hackney Community College, and uh, second season. The idea was to uh, now we will start laughing. The idea is that we move to O2. Fantastic idea! <laughs> Fantastic idea. Who wouldn't believe that? Uh, to cut the story short. Uh, the money dry out. There was some concept. There was the fact that I believe in that that we will have that much money was was uh, was completely uh, naive from my point of view. It was untrue. In the end of the season, the money um, uh, money dry up. We didn't get any kind of investment. Of course, moving to O2 was as close to reality as me traveling to Mars right now. <laughs> so obviously that, that didn't pan out at all. And and the one thing which actually I'm I'm proud of because when I realized that there will be no investment, uh, we paid all our debts from our own pockets. We never own any money, no bankruptcies, no nothing like that, which I think is a terrible way of dealing with things. Uh, I know that was inconvenient for BBL, but as soon as we decided um, there is no 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 uh, no money there and expenses are pretty pretty high. And of course, movement to O2 is completely impossible. We move out. I think the movement to East London was complete, complete mistake. It was complete mistake. Maybe, 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 but that's big. Maybe if we stay where we were, where and played from Brunel, maybe we survive, financially we could have survived. But uh, how I said, that was the 
building ev everything on 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 wrong wrong presumption on believing in. But you know, there was pre-Olympic things. People were to get excited about things. You know, people people believed that, and, and with I would say with good foundation that Olympics could be the catalyst, in, impetus into some uh, building something on completely different scale. So, in when I look from the hindsight, me listening in 2006 to say, being told that look, East London is the place to be, an investment will be there, actually wasn't completely baseless though, because enormous investment happened to, into in, uh, took place and been an enormous amount of money being invested into both infrastructure and the, this entire part of London. However, we weren't <laughs> recipients of this investment. How were you, who was who was funding? You had one major sponsor, right? Was it like MoneyGram or something like that? Money, my, my, or some this, type of money thing. Money, MoneyGram. There's no secret in that. It's no secret in that. Uh, MoneyGram's money was actually brought by me, uh, and it was a good contract. But there was no way in hell that MoneyGram. Uh, MoneyGram chronologically happened after us being persuaded to move to East London on completely different funding, the MoneyGram should be, you know, on the top of something, never of the backbone. Of, so how, how of, are you funding wow. it then? We were funding that from uh, MoneyGram, our own money, which we generate from, uh, generated from the games. And as a matter of fact, London United at that time were run by David Schiller and myself. So that's how we funded it. Wow. That's how we found it this year. And so you, and you lasted, season, what, one, was it one full season? That one was season, it. And you pulled season, out before the second season. Correct. One season, we won first three games, or first three games on the road. We led the BBL, still qualified to the playoff. And uh, no, I simply said, uh, I'm, I'm, if anything, I'm very proud of that, um, uh, that I've done it. I said, uh, and David Schiller, as a matter of fact, we said, no, we're not paying ourselves for the next year if the money which were promised and we thought will come uh, is not are not materializing. Here is the here is the deadline. Here is the demarcation line. Up to this moment, if we've got the money, we go ahead. If not, thank you very much. We have to pull out. We'll write our own checks, cover all debts. We walk out with zero debts. But the checks were paid by myself and Dave Schiller. Oh. And I'm very proud of this approach. Maybe it didn't make us very, very popular with BBL because, the, as a matter of fact, announcement was quite late. And I fully appreciate that in terms of you know, logistics, image, and everything was not good. But I think there was the right time. And as a fact, we waited to absolutely last moment to think of, uh, to wait for perhaps some chance of getting money, which we thought are coming, they weren't coming. We said, no, no, I'm not paying for it myself. And and simply, you know, you, you're talking about uh, difficult decisions. You know, 2006, uh, I've got two daughters. Why should I spend the money on something which I don't believe it? Why my inheritance money or the university money are spent on that, on this kind of thing? But that goes to to stable environment. In the very small things, a small scale, myself and Dave Schiller were investors. So we've seen instability of this program. We say, no, we will not, we will not involve our own money in something which we clearly don't see uh, any kind of return in monetary terms or in terms of investment. There was no junior program there. Uh, our junior program was 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 uh, based at uh, Richmond Junior Program actually did did suffer because of my involvement in in DBL. So no, we made a clear decision then, and I think it was the right decision. However, I appreciate the I appreciate the uh, the bad connotation in terms of logistic timing image. Yes, I do understand that, but I think that was the right decision. And so then, and the uh, Surrey United situation. Surrey United situation was. Uh, was far more better conceived and better thought idea. Uh, actually, genesis of Sari program comes from um, comes from being approached by Bucks New University, which came to us and we ran a very successful program at Herfield at a certain time. At Herfield, we had. Um, uh, 
50 students, 50 students, and uh, actually I live in Iver in Buckinghamshire, literally 20 minutes from uh, High Wycombe where Bax New University is, I never heard about Bax New University, and people from Bax New University turn up and say, look, this program at Hellfield is extremely successful, can you replicate that on, 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 on um, uh, university level? And by that time, I was absolutely certain that I will never get involved in BBL uh, again. But um, they said, "Look, um, would you would you would you replicate this program?" And we were tempted to do a big program for universities because Harfield was successful. The other other educational enterprises were very successful. So we thought, "Yes, we will do that." And uh, we needed some form of carrot for because the idea was to get a. Mm, older uh, players, so we thought in principle that actually may be a good idea because if you've got something, I said exposure is the exposure is the exposure is the currency. So uh, we thought like if we've got a big enough carrot and we will expose young players from all over Europe, we somehow we somehow can um, uh, persuade them to come because we'll say look you need to play in BBL highest level in England, the program will be based on very young English players or very young EU players, because EU players can study, can study, could study in England, yeah. Uh, obviously, there, there was, uh, there were a couple issues there. So, despite the fact that I think philosophically it was very good, good situation, um, uh, and the program was far more intelligently fought than uh, our move to Hackney. Uh, very soon we found out that there's a couple issues that we weren't recruiting as good players from abroad as we were hoping. Uh, foreign players were still asking, uh, were asking for scholarships. They said, I will come here if we'll get scholarships. <sighs> We found out that there was not as many scholarships as uh, we could, were hoping for EU students. Obviously, that and God God lives in details. Honestly, God lives in details. Sometimes best conceived programs are 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 failing because of details. So we were training in High Wycombe or in Herfield with our players. We had to go to the games, and then at that time we purchased all the Guildford Heat. Yeah. And we renamed it as a Sari, 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 Sari United. So we had to, we trained in High Wycombe. We had to go for the games to university, which effectively, apart from using the sports hall, we didn't have too much, much uh, connection. And the uh, program existed in, in two years. First, half of the uh, first season was absolute disaster. We were losing uh, left, right and center in embarrassing way. But then, uh, after Christmas, we turned around the program uh, very well. We uh, second, we were able to attract some Americans, and we won a couple games, and we also had very close games. Uh, pro, um, for second year, we had much stronger teams, but then we started having problems with accommodation of those players. We went to even to the extent like where uh, uh, we had to rent entire converted pub, which was converted into a small hotel for 20 rooms. And the amount of problems with these accommodations and uh, maybe, maybe, actually, the High Wycombe was super, uh, Bax New was super supportive in their, their small institution. So they, they were doing as much as they could. Surrey United, I mean, uh, University of Surrey, completely different story, which I don't want to get involved in it because they'll end up in a situation which wasn't a pleasant, very pleasant, uh, was as not as supportive as, as especially in the second year. And again, you know, we did, came to a conclusion that uh, no, this model is, is, is not working and it's no, it's not again. It's not working because there's so much time involved. And you will laugh at that, but instead of coaching or, or doing things like that, we spent enormous time um, trying to sort out accommodation accommodation issues, which became a very, very important. You know, if the players are not in comfortable circumstances, obviously for some, uh, you can expect that they are not very happy. Well, we, we will leave, uh, maybe we'll not say what they were doing themselves there as well. But, you know, that goes that the program was underinvested because if we could uh, employ someone who look after 
logistic uh, factors for players or participants of that maybe that would be would be better if we had a better you know. do, do you still have bbo aspirations or do you think you're no 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 zero zero aspirations zero aspiration how i said at this one for us we don't have any uh, bbl uh, aspiration I, I really i really i really think and i there is a couple programs in England. That's not. You said that there, there were pocket pockets of good. That's how you. That was your expression. Yeah, there are pockets. Of good. There are very good pockets of good. But uh, for us, that would have to be some philosoph. Uh, uh, philosoph. Maybe I will try, uh, rephrase that. Do I have a BBL um, uh, uh, ambitions? Well, if the circumstances are right. For instance, twice in past. Three years, we were very close to having some form of our own facility and facilities which we which we wanted. So if we control the facility, we've got and finally we build some more facility facility which hopefully is shared by not only uh, basketball but sim uh, similar sports uh, being in a similar situation like volleyball. There's a man, immense need for handball situation, and if in the court uh, facility which you want to build, we can squeeze the handball court as well. So if we've got a facility which we, which we manage, and philosophically a program suits us, meaning is based on very young players, who because that's that's um, for me from my point of view, and I'm sure I'm right. Philosophically, the only sensible way of running uh, the program on BBL level or pro level is for very young players who will use your program as a springboard to into into different clubs. But then then you have to expose them to very high profile profile sport. I mean, playing in Europe. So if 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 we are in a situation of controlling facility, generating income from the facility. Having strong support from academic institution, uh, maybe, maybe, but it's not something which we, which we at this moment thinking that no, at the current, and current structure, BBL is the perfect way to lose the money. That's uh, is much easier, much much less time consuming to burn the money because at least you don't have to travel and spend the time. You can, you can, you can use the other time. Yeah. One of the the other interesting things that you said that I yeah that I sort of latched onto was um, talking about the role of of schools and sort of the over reliance on schools. In, in some ways, when you're talking about the development of basketball in the UK, you know people talk about schools constantly as, as a key piece of the puzzle because obviously that's where you've got access to the kids and it doesn't have to be extracurricular. And and kind of you said, well, yeah, on, on the one hand, it does provide a level of stabilisation which the school which the sport needs so so drastically. But also on the, on the flip side of that, it does mean you're at the mercy of the head teacher and the sort of the direction the school wants to take. And all of a sudden, they could turn around tomorrow and say, "Do you know what? Actually, we don't we don't want to make basketball priority anymore." And you know, I look at I kind of look at the different institutions where London United or, or sort of you as a club has been based over the number of years. You just recently you know moved into Norfolk. Before that, you're at you're at Alec, Alec Reed. You're at um, Harefield Academy. You're obviously at Richmond. Is that exactly kind of what's happening in all those situations? And kind of, I guess, can you talk about sort of the the importance of schools and the roles that schools play? Oh, that's that's definitely. And we are not. We know that we are not only ones. But chronologically, you said that Richmond. We spent uh, ten years. Ten years um, there. Actually, movement to uh, Herfield was completely was almost issue of headhunting. There was absolutely possessed um, a deputy head, fantastic woman who really would break every single barrier to build whatever she wanted to build. And 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 um, we spent there seven years building a very successful program, very good one. But but as a matter of fact, that was uh, we as a charity we ran their their facility. We were uh, we were. In charge of hiring the entire facilities, again, 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 again. Um, after seven years, from very, very good, strong position, when you not only running very big program, you know, could you imagine that that was absolutely crazy program? Um, and because that was in the high days, probably too many, fifty basketball players and around hundred students. Uh, what for? Because the entire uh, sixth form was based. Uh, between uh, Watford, there was collaboration between Watford School and us. We were teaching all uh, six form Watford, so masses of students. One change of the head, uh, and 
almost in the same week Watford and us pull out from the, from the entire project. So could you imagine? Okay, say 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 say. Um, okay, the basketball project maybe not that strong, but Watford and Watford were then in Premier, uh, Premiership. Then. Watford invested. Would, could you imagine? Watford, Watford invested uh, something to the tune of three hundred thousand pounds in artificial pitch in 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 uh, Hellfield, run their all academies from Hellfield, one change of head. Of course, what for the Spanish, you know, clubs of 300,000 probably means they spend more on the Christmas too. For people. But they said, well, well, if you don't like it, you don't like it. We go and what for these buildings their own own center in St. Albans. I'm, I'm very close with, with, with them. And they build their own center because they said exactly, exactly to answer your question. It's like, we don't want to be in position like 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 that again. And we want to be in something which we con- which we control. Movement to Harefield, uh, to Alegreed, where we were very close. We were going to plan permission, of, and and we had a very good, a very good investment from uh, uh, London Marathon. So the money weren't actually issued. There. We were going from uh, plan permission to 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 cover four tennis courts to create 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 the, the facility there. We were very excited about that. Again, one change of one change of head and so so, so how, how can you how can you combat that like is there a way that potentially you know when you go into an, an academy to set something up like this you you sign a multi-year contract that guarantees that you've got i don't know 10 15 20 years or whatever out of it or or is it something that's completely unavoidable well uh, no no uh, i think why i'm i'm sounding um I, when I sounded very adamant in the licensing, not contracting junior players, and uh, that's the job for England uh, basketball, and that can be done with one decision over one day, with issue of facility, I fully appreciate that's not one simple decision can be done over one day. Having said so, having said so, I, as a maniac, almost like a maniacally, I will go back to stronger clubs, guaranteeing that, that they will get the students for uh, longer in bigger volumes would be much better partner for conversation with academic institutions than current clubs current current clubs and current basketball institutions are not seen as a I was saying equal you are not seeing as a strong enough partner to have this conversation I'm not saying it's unavoidable I'm sure that it is possible to set up the situation I, I think I think the the way forward is collaboration of variety of sports to tell the truth to make it to make your case stronger you know if schools uh, see the situation that not maybe via basketball but via combination of variety of sports we were excited about volleyball project yeah you're bringing on yearly basis 40 students that's and that's translating to money so I'm I'm I think that is the, the common theme of our conversation. I hope that we get to coaching because that's, I don't know how we missed that one because that's that's the that's the crux of the matter as well. Uh, I think the stronger organization. No, that, that's pointing to obvious. Stronger organ for me building strong organization which can be partner for conversation with uh, commercial sponsors, academic institutions. Uh, with all sorts of partners is, is the key. You know, the cottage industry. Uh, sporting clubs run by the parent who thinks their kid will be a superstar uh, are not part of you. You don't see that. You don't attract the money this way. You don't. You don't build lasting partnership. No, whether we like it or not, money decides the entire business. This is a business, so that's, that must be an intelligently built a business proposition to for 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 everyone. But you see, I think we need to venture, venture, venture. Into, in, I want to go back to to this conversation about right, right environment. How on earth? How on earth? A country like Slovenia, which has got the two million people, two million people live in Slovenia. Yeah? It's not only we are talking about super strong uh, basketball program, current European champion Doncic, uh, Dragic, Nestorovic, God knows who played the past, Gregor Fuchka, Jaka, uh, Laka Jakovic. Yeah, how on earth they got a very strong, super strong basketball, super strong volleyball, super strong handball, 
okay, it's football. And all of a sudden, they become superpower in, 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 in cycling. So it's not only um, uh, what's Roglic, it's not only Mohorec. There are entire team uh, sponsored by entire state of Bahrain. Bahrain Merida is based in Slovenia because they created right environment for such investment. So I will go back to it, to it that no, it's not avoidable. If you build strong enough organizations, you, you can you 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 can uh, attract investment. You can build something far stronger, far more uh, stable. Something which is uh, is a partner of conversation with a variety of institution, of commercial and and and, 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 and um, public ones. So you, you gave me the bait there, and let's let's just uh, I'm aware of time, so let's let's talk about coaching. You know, I know that over the years you've you've talked about it a lot in terms of the complete lack of investment in coaching in this country and uh, sort of I guess it's struggle with provide being a viable pathway career profession for for people can you I guess give us your views on 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 coaching and what you see the issues are and how uh, we as a sport can go about improving it well actually when I said about I would say going back to your question about stable clubs so this licensing players having stable clubs facility and investment in coaching should be three pillars of changing this uh, changing this this entire thing entire situation of english basketball there is absolutely no way no way and that's we will talk about examples uh, um, from all over the world and different different sports without investment without the professional coaches and coaches seeing coaching basketball as a profession and a very viable way of providing for the family, we, we cannot do nothing. We cannot, we're we, we just kidding ourselves. We, I know that Brian is doing a very good program with Erasmus, and we think cancer Brian Aldridge of Basketball England, just so people know. Brian, Brian, Brian Aldridge, he's doing, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Brian Aldridge is doing that, but that's not enough. That's, that's something which should be on the top of proper environment for coaches to thrive. And that's another myth, urban myth, that these coaches will coach it will cost a lot. No, they won't. They won't cost. I know what the how much it costs to employ young up and coming. Initially, it would have to be foreign coach. Uh, and unfortunately, I said young. I'm not. not uh, by the way, I'm excluding myself now from from this entire uh, equation, because coaching is uh, for eighty percent. Uh, young man job. We need to have a young, driven people who wants to build um, a career for themselves, who are ready to kill their mothers, in inverted commas, to, to succeed, who are unbelievably driven, who are really unbelievably educated, but we have to create the situation for them to, 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 to succeed. And again, look at that, look at the situation. How do you expect? It, well, Look at successful programs, and I was thinking like recently, again, very young coach when he started at Jalgiris, Yasikevich was 39, 40 maximum. He's 44 now, so four years. Went to Barcelona. So he was, uh, when he started, he was the uh, paid piper catalyst for entire renaissance of Jalgiris, and he took them to unbelievable heights. He is replaced by a young coach, by the way, he's got a British passport, Martin Schiller, who is Austrian with British passport. He was replaced by a 37 years old coach who left Austria, who, let's face it, is not exactly a hotbed of basketball. He went to uh, play in G League, he became a um, uh, coach of the year, he was in uh, Salt Lake City. And again, young person, an energetic young person who wants to make a name for himself, comes to Shalkiris, comes to EuroLeague to, 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 to carry the program. Uh, we talked before when we initially, uh, the Spanish coach um, Pedro Coles in uh, Vechta, in BBL, German BBL, who is indefinitely stronger than, uh, than, than British BBL, 35 years old coach comes, Vechta, um, team which always fights against relegation, all of a sudden becomes the team which plays currently in Champions League. In best, and then we can talk about uh, millions of, when uh, uh, Red Bull went to to Leipzig to set up their uh, famous football uh, program. First investment was in, was in the coaches. Coaches who can uh, 
entire, uh, who can embrace and implement entire philosophy. Coaches are the backbone of everything, and they don't coach that much. They don't cost that much. Trust me. Trust me. I know how our situation with estudiantes looks like. Uh, so, uh, and there's a lot of young people, especially in current situation, you know, in coronavirus even can help in this situation. There will be a lot of people looking for good. But the problem is they will not come to England till they see it as a proper way of exposure, till they will see opportunity for them to, to work, to work. In other way, for money, for money as well, but for exposure, to create something. And we'll go back to, to, to Christian. The crucial question of this entire conversation, which I enjoy very much. So the situation is that till English club will not create the environment when foreign young coaches will see that as a breeding ground for young, talented, both players and coaches, they will not come. And then go back to my initial situation that the English clubs will not be stable. At least we will have a licensed players. They at least, uh, could you imagine, uh, for God, uh, God's sake, what about if some agencies would send here the players, which I don't know, maybe Wedge is a good example. Maybe they contracted with the agency, but they would send them to British club and all of a sudden they find out they left this club, go somewhere else. This agent would go completely crazy. So, you know, probably Serbian agent, agent like Raznato, which probably would send some, uh, you know, uh, professional killer squad here to kill someone here because that would be so, no. Yeah. So, uh, till we've got a situation when thing is, entire scene is stabilized, we will not, will not succeed. England basketball, the fact that the coaches are unpaid, it's not a bad situation. Is insult. Is insult. The people who everything should be built around are unpaid. Is insult. Could you imagine? Uh, I don't know. Abramovich talking to Mourinho and saying the project is good, but we pay zero. You will be volunteer here. Then. Let's do something. <laughs> sure, sure. What? What are you talking? About? This. Yeah. These are the first people who should be paid. That should be uh, people who are picked. We've got the philosophy behind why we're picking them, create the opportunity for them to work, see the see in entire English project as a something which will suit them. People will go to amazing length if you enthuse them and you see you create the vision for them. If they see vision of coming to come to England, the great coaches, great Serbian coaches, great uh, how many Slovenian coaches, Spanish coaches, these guys are looking for the job. They would see the Croatian. These guys will look at as exposure. Coaches, coaches should be paid. The coach who coach national team should be the guy who create or participate in creating philosophy. And we're building everything around him. That's, that's how it should be. How on earth you can have paid members of the federation and the most important people, by long shot, people who should create, decide about everything are unpaid. That's 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 unthinkable. Well, on on that sort of uh, note about sort of your relationships and um, European club and stuff. Obviously, last week, week before last, you announced this partnership with Estudiantes, uh, and they're going to be working with your club. Kind of, can you talk about that? How that came about, and how do you see that helping, um, and what exactly it will result in? I like this actually how 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 I'm hoping I'm not quite sure we do resolve from it, but the concept behind that is actually we touched touched the subject because first of all uh, it was very important that as to young, no, no, even by definition with the names there's very closely connected um, institution to to education to university actually they 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 came as a transformation as a came about as a transformation of university. And uh, they, uh, I think they are very important because they put so much emphasis on young players. And then uh, they created unbelievable players. Uh, Rodriguez was there, Chacho Rodriguez was, was a young player, there's Felipe Reyes, Herman Gomez. Is there. So they've got very, and they very good, well-established interest in creating their own player, the starting point guard in Salah is 19 years old at this moment. So they've got a very well-established 
philosophy of working with young players and and developing them and they are courageous enough to put them on 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 uh, NC, a, a, abc court, acb court and and giving them an almost exposure as a matter of fact their head coach zamora is the guy who worked with the junior program he got promoted as a senior coach so the entire philosophy runs for the club um, the, another thing is that they, they are in ACB, but they are close to the bottom of ACB, and it's very important because they, for them, there is a two-way, uh, two-way motorway. They're very interested and they very aware. I was surprised how aware they are of the talent in England, and they want to tap into this talent, and that's that's very good. They want to have a, 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 a way into getting into British talent and exploring this talent. And we, we've got like a pejorative uh, connotation to war, exploring. Exploring is good. These guys, let them sign the contract in Spain. I would like to be explored like that. So mm -hmm. uh, so um, they want to explore the talent. They are positioned that way that if we sa said that we signed a contract with Real Madrid, maybe that would be great PR exercise, but for, in fact, it would be like, well, what we do, what do, are we for Real Madrid? We, they, they can get everyone, and they don't care about English kids at this point. So I think from the position in the league, their interest in history, they are they are very very much um, interested and can work both ways. Uh, the contract is long term, it's three years. Uh, they send in the coach, and there's coach... Um, we want to be first to announce the name, so we will not uh, will not say the name. But coach who had a very good history to working with the junior programs, both boys and girls, as a matter of fact, and uh, who will be the guy who I won't say that we'll have a decide about the philosophy, but we will work with him very closely to 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 to, to decide the entire philosophy how we coach, why we employing him, not to listen to him. Of course we want to listen to him and the entire estudiantes what how they would approach. The fact that that will be his full time job and uh, he doesn't do anything else without asking him to clean the windows by the way and drive the Uber car and, and spare time coach so that's important for us and, and I think there's also um, symbolical sign in that, that we say like no we do want to spend the money we want to invest into into coaches because they are the backbone of, of everything without the good coaches will not move um, inch further also the fact which I also mentioned before that by working with estudiantes so close uh, we provide something important for young English players. They must see, actually, I don't know why I, don't, uh, I, I didn't touch that, probably I'm aging now. <laughs> we have to provide them with the window of opportunity as well. So, you know, we can talk about the stability of the clubs, they are very important, but the English guys and their parents, and their parents must see basketball as a, a genuine career. And at this moment, would be fantastic if some English, hopefully our guys, some other English guys, would sign some high-profile contracts in in Spain. Because from I'm the parent, actually my kids are nothing to do with the sport, but I'm, I'm sure you appreciate parents looking and saying, look, uh, here is some jug or something like that, trying to convince my son to devote his entire life to the sport of basketball. Which I am certain versus why he doesn't devote uh, his entire sport uh, life to the sport of rugby. That, that's that's clear path, well established path. He he will get 150, 200, 300 thousand. If he's more talented, why he doesn't go into football? He will get 100 thousand a week. So why well, why should he go into basketball? So by definition, by the fact that and going back to our uh, main theme, weak clubs, uh, English clubs cannot attract the. Uh, major talent, major physical talent, and that's what it's about. It's another bit around the bushes that's about attracting top physical talent, best access to be best pool uh, pool of uh, genes is is very important. We we should work with the most talented kids. These kids choosing the different sport because financially, what this basketball really gives them. So for us to give a creating window opportunity to say, okay, fine, we take it. He didn't earn this money in England, but via us, he went to to Spain or wherever, and then he signed a sizable, sensible contract. 
I'm sure that's that's attractive, both in terms of conversation with kids first and foremost, and then with the parents. You know, parents are important. Parents, parents play an important role. You know, why should they play? Push them into sport, which I don't know what this sport will really do for you. Instead of a big athletic kid, go rugby. You know, Harlequins will pay you hundred fifty thousand a year, and you know something like that. Yeah, yeah so that's. Yeah. The other thing that we haven't touched upon yet, which I did want to just speak about, is Future Stars, the tournament. Um, obviously, that was one of the first tournaments that was one of the first tournaments I ever filmed. So uh, that was 2000, 2009 in Kingston. Uh, you know, and over the years, I think, so you were pretty consistent with it from about 2008 to 2013, I think. Uh, and, you know, you had Division A sides over here, under 18, it was under 18 international tournament. So you had, you know, Spain, Poland, Italy. Um, a bu- Croatia, Croatia. Croatia. Saric was, was here. Yeah, Saric, uh, Sans, Rudy, Rudy Gobert, Rudy Gobert. Rudy Gobert. A bunch yeah. of a bunch of future NBA players. Like it was, it was a pretty big deal. Um, and obviously you brought it back last year as a as a sort of a club tournament, which happened at a different time of the year. Can you kind of talk about the the evolution of that? What made you do it in the first place? Um, and then I guess what happened with it, kind of why, why it stopped in its initial sort of uh, format. Totally. You, you know, I think you you can say a lot of things about me, but I'm not, uh, I don't have any hesitation to talk about the money. Money. You know, you're spending, you're spending a significant amount of money, future stars cost around 20,000 per week, uh, per weekend, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Per weekend. No, uh, so... Uh, for national teams, I see that oh, that's the business. You know, we, we are not in habit to giving someone twenty thousand a weekend. Uh, we were uh, we were work for us for a while, very good because we always said that we'll invite certain teams if they invite us back. Yeah, and they allow us, they pay for us staying for up to the week in their their facility. Worked to some extent. Some federation again. Weak perception perception of weak English basketball. They said, ah, no, we don't care. We will not invite you. We, that, that was then we said we'll invite you. <laughs> no, we will not invite you. So it was very good, very well, very well received. And actually some crowds at Future Stars were, were, were amazing, to tell the truth. It was very good. But it was very expensive. And and uh, these return trips of Richmond College uh, did happen to Slovenia, Poland, but then not not very frequently. Uh, and that became very expensive for national teams. Uh, of course, um, uh, being involved because uh, chronologically it happens exactly when BBL, we started BBL, yeah. So BBL cost us money as well. So we didn't want to spend uh, this money on future stars. We spent on BBL, BBL money, and uh, idea became kind of a recreation of it was also the kind of philosophical thing to say, look, maybe instead of saying that for national teams, which let's, let's not pretend we are not national team, uh, would be much better if we create this as a preseason instead of last tournament, last preparation stage before European Championship for national team. We said, no, 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 there is more intelligent to do it as a preparation tournament because all these club teams are dying to 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 have some preseason tournament. Even the high-profile teams are dying to have a, tor- a tournament. So let's organize for the high-profile tournaments uh, for teams in uh, club teams. The, that was the first one. Second one was our conversation with Euroleague, and without uh, going into into details, actually, conclusion was uh, with this conversation was uh, actually what we already know that Euroleague speaking, who is the strongest one in Europe via our next generation tournament. Yeah? And I thought, like, myself, eh, you don't know actually everything. You don't know how this strong team is against very strong AAU teams uh, or Institute of Sport from Australia. If we get, you know, something like that, we get top teams from Europe versus really strong AAU teams or, for instance, Australian teams. What about Argentinians? What about Argentinian programs? When these programs are dying to be in, in, in Europe, another perfect partner, NBA Africa, they play in, e, in EYBL. Why not in our tournament? Of course they wanted to come. And tr- trust me, you, uh, NBA Africa, in terms of pro talent, that's that's phenomenal, what, what they've got. So we came up with this idea, we got the money to run that as a concept of top Europeans versus top Americans. That's how it meant to be run uh, this year. That's what we want to run in both categories, under 16 and under 18. 
As a matter of fact, uh, uh, it was heartbreaking because our, as in fact, the person who was bringing to um, American teams, and he brought Carmelo Anthony, he brought Kevin Durant to this tournament in Douai, in France. We obviously we forged very good relationship since that time, since Louis Denk was 15 or 16 years old. And uh, we, we in touch, we good friends. We said, well, le let's um, uh, reinvigorate the entire situation. And he wanted to bring people of similar talent this year. The team was already confirmed. Uh, it was people like DJ Wagner was there. There were six players there from uh, under 16 American team playing in uh, for a uh, national American team in FIBA America. So super strong team. Well, we have uh, coronavirus happened, and, and we had to cancel the entire thing. And we had to cancel, uh, cancel the entire thing. There's absolutely no way that we can conduct a tournament of this scale, so complicated. People traveling from different countries with different level of uh, COVID-19. Uh, uh, first, first team, which actually parents said there is no way they will travel to um, to Europe was American team because they had very strong, very strong opposing voices from from parents of the players and actually I do understand that and then you know that trigger entire thing other clubs uh, massive clubs such as Giris, uh, uh, big Spanish clubs <laughs> we had very 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 kind of advanced conversation with Barcelona had come they said look our finances are we don't know where our budgets are really in current situation and first thing which will be cut is 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 in our junior programs and for instance the studiantes for instance was another big program uh, problem because they were last one them and Bayern Munich as the matter of Bayern Munich Bayern Munich was so sold on entire concept that they wanted to come week earlier and use that as a pre-season camp and the end of this camp to stay at Brunello of course fantastic facility for 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 uh, for training. And they want to stay entire week, and the end of, end of the season, uh, end of the week, wanted to play the tournament. So it was fantastic, fantastic, like extension of what we wanted to do. Especially the American team meant to come four days earlier. So already America, England usually comes earlier. So that was that was like really nice community creating there, people exchanging information. You know, we do this, we do that, and all of a sudden coronavirus happened. But uh, I, I started with Estudiantes. Estudiantes won, was the, one of the last ones who wanted to come, but then came to realization that all the foreign players, and majority of them they, uh, are in uh, South America, will not come. So, because they're in South America, and they, they've got no idea when they will see them in Spain, to say nothing about flying them to to England, but now we reach completely different. So, 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 <clears throat> how do you go about funding something like this? Like, obviously, you just spoke about the the the, the cost of in, in talking about twenty thousand pounds for the weekend. Obviously, even, you know this one that you did in, in twenty nineteen. Like, what are the actual income streams that allow you to put it on? Because, yeah, by all accounts, I know that you know venues aren't cheap, accommodation isn't cheap. Um, you know, how, how are you actually making it happen? Um, actually, that's not a secret. Uh, I don't have a, a, a problem with talking about money. England, uh, actually, that's a very positive thing. Uh, uh, Future Stars was financed by, in no particular order, by England Basketball. And again, Brian Aldrich and his involvement with Clinic uh, was, was fantastic. And... You see, that's, that's that's the way how you should build long-term partnerships. Where you know Brian was uh, Audrey was for the entire time supporting this uh, coaching uh, clinics. That was a uh, grant from England Basketball. Uh, England Basketball paying for their own team and something on the top of that. And uh, that was a private uh, company, private Lit Lithuanian company, which covered the rest of of the cost. This year, and I don't want to go into this, we had a massive international uh, education institution sponsoring it. Actually, this year, Future Stars meant to be called XYZ Future Stars. There was big, big uh, educational institution, international educational institution sponsoring it. Uh, and I, I see, I see perfect, perfect logic why, why. Uh, talking to educational institution uh, about that because um, we had the teams from all over Europe and America so we were we were expecting quite quite big exposure and actually 
actually we had to postpone quite interesting conversation about a lot of things because the future starts to open a lot of doors for a lot of conversation. And so the, the value for an educational institution like that is that we're running a tournament, it's got our name all over it, and then if we you know end up with, I don't know, a couple of uh, international students enrolling, the cost of their tuition will more than cover the sponsorship of, of what they're providing you. Easy. Right. Easy. Easy. Easily. I guess a f- final question would be just like in terms of if, Jesus Christ, two hours. Don't two worry, hours. We're, yeah, we're wrapping up. We're wrapping up. The, the final. No, don't qu- worry, I don't, I don't. I, I enjoyed it as hell. When you said, uh, I don't know, I probably show my inexperience. I thought like twenty minutes or something like that. When you said <laughs> hour ninety minutes, I was like, oh, long. That no, no, we go hours. long. We go long. It's, it's good to no, go. No, it's it's good to go in depth. Um, Go on, go it, on. It's clear you're Ask like. About money. Ask about money. It's, it's, it's clear you're super money. connected, right? You have a lot of relationships, uh, not just in the basketball world, outside of the basketball world. That's what's allowed you to do all the things that you've done, you know, build the programs you've done and, and sort of do the events. Like, how have you gone about cultivating those relationships and being in, in positions where you've kind of got this uh, widespread network that allows you to facilitate the things that you're trying to do within British basketball? <laughs> well, that's a tricky question. I was very forthcoming <laughs> with all answers. How do you build a network of 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 of, of relationships? Good question. Yeah, I'm rarely speechless, but no. Okay, well, because the thing is right. Like, there's, no, no, there's... no. I understand the question. I understand the fantastic question. I'm not sure whether I've got equally good answer. So, I, well, you know. For instance, I give you a good example. A good example. Uh, a recent example. So, uh, Estudiantes is sponsored by Movistar. Yeah? Movistar, in fact, is a um, uh, telecommunication company uh, dealing with Hispanic or uh, countries which are close to Spanish uh, culture, uh, Southern America on, or on things like that. Spain, of course. Uh, they sponsor their own massive cycling team. Yeah. So, for instance, how you build the how you build the network and how you cultivate that. It's important to cultivate. It's important to cultivate because uh, if I didn't become friends with Lindsay Davis, who the American guy who was bringing Kevin Garnett, uh, uh, and Carmelo Anthony, and those people in France. Uh, 15 years ago, I wouldn't have a Lindsay Davis bringing people to this tournament. So you have to maintain this contact. You have to speak to those people. You have to actually, you have to offer them something. You have to offer them something. And for the hundred times, I will go back to stronger, stronger clubs. If you are in stronger position, you've got more offer. People want to talk, talk more to you. And I know that sounds terribly not politically correct. Stronger you are, more you can do it. More you can do it. Uh, uh, people, don't, that's why I said England, English basketball or English federation begging for money puts them in very weak position. Never beg, earn the money. Put yourself on equal terms with them. You, if you talk to your partners, you say, okay, I'm not saying that I'm in equal terms with Movistar, God forbid. But if you say, look, do that for me, I will do something else for you, which is important. Uh, how we except except it didn't take you very long to 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 figure out how with major in, uh, education institution works. I, we asking them give us X amount of money, but if if we help you to recruit the students, you're making business out of that. So yeah. please yeah. write the check. Okay. Going back, you need to be creative. You need to be creative, and then again, I use the word. Um, Stagnated, uh, uh, boring, and uninspiring to to um, to de- describe English basketball current state of English basketball. That that hampered the business, but more inspiring you've got. And trust me, at this moment, the young people are coming with such. Um, the world is changing. You 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 should lecture me. You sh- I, I would like to hear from you how to be more creative. More creative you are. Uh, more, more, more partners you you can find, and you have to look for the the ability of being thrown through the wind, uh, through, uh, kicked out through the door, and come back through the window, or God knows what other hole in this building may exist, or create the hole for yourself, create the hole for yourself, and move fast. I, I'm a huge believer of thinking it's better to run fast and hit the wall than walk. 
So, you know, get hidden and be creative with that. For instance, that's why I bit drifted from basket, away from basketball because, for instance, what have, uh, the example for, with movie star, okay, so movie star is an estudiant, but movie star, uh, movie star as a company also own the professional cycling team, yeah? Cycling, so let's have a conversation, okay? We have a conversation. Let's, cycling is super popular in, in this country, don't you think? Okay, Skype pull out, but in EOS took over, yeah? Cycling is massive business in this country. Cyclists need to start somewhere. Someone needs to educate this cyclist. What about if the cyclist from London, which has got 10 million people, and, and Slovenia creates this, uh, such an immense, immense success on 2 million, so we've got in London 10 million, so a few talent is here. How about if we educate the cyclists somewhere in, in one, one place? And, you know, there are big names involved in cy- cycling in this country and everywhere. And, you know, a uh, uh, steady influx of young cyclists is very important to those people. So I think it's important to... To, to think outside the box and create the opportunity for yourself and 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 then uh, try to combine a lot of things and you know see the far bigger picture and and for God's sake you can say the worst things to people but you only in situation when there is two way traffic when you know you can be harsh with the partners but you have to offer them something you say, you must say look guys yeah. then yeah. you knew this you give us that. Uh, we don't have to love each other, but we we'll respect each other, and 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 I think that's also missing in 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 English basketball. It's, I really dislike this position of weakness. I really don't like to be in a situation when I come and I have to beg for something, and I got a zero to offer. That's the worst worst negotiating. And people very quickly will dislike you for it. If I constantly beg you for something. If I come to you, some please, another interview, some do this for me, some do that. Okay, so you stop answering the phone. Yeah. So yeah. I think the, the creating the situation that both parties can somehow benefit. And I think you need to be creative, you know. For instance, Emma, who is, who is director of an entire charity, she's the only second person in England who graduated from this Euroleague uh, master degree run by uh, Italian University in Venice. So I'm sure that, uh, because she's seen the benefit of it. She's seen something, maybe she's seen this as a benefit into investing into herself. So ability to invest in yourself, that's another thing which is important. We cannot expect, we can only expect to earn the money which we invest. And we can invest a lot of things. We can invest our own money, more frequently, our own time, our own effort. We have, that has to be two-way system. We invest something into it, and then we in strong position, give us back. Yeah, the, 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 the other thing, the final thing, just to add on to the end here, that I found really interesting about what you said is that uh, basketball in this country plays way too hard on the social value of it. Um, I, I've, I've got the... I've got the original quote here. You said something along the lines of the social value of basketball is grotesquely grotesquely overused and overvalued um and i thought that was a super interesting proposition because we're always told the opposite we're always told about the fact that you know look at the impact it has in in communities and in uh, in inner city communities and in keeping kids off the street um in households from low-income backgrounds um in ethnic minorities uh so yeah where does that thought process come from and can you kind of i guess uh give us a breakdown of of your thought process around it I, I I totally start, stand by this quote. Uh, I think I think uh, we cover this begging and uh, negative aspects of begging in terms of image, but then as the only kind of value of the sport, we adding adding social aspect and saving uh, kids from God knows from what from we not saving them from anything. Uh, quite contrary, we playing quite detrimental role for that the, the, this situation. This situation because first of all we not offering uh, anything valuable for these kids in terms of career, in terms of very little in terms of educational opportunity, and uh, we don't create anything for them which can be carrot magnet getting them really strongly from from whatever bet they may be doing come on 
think about that. If we approach the kids from difficult areas, difficult backgrounds, sometimes very difficult backgrounds, and we often they say, come to us, uh, uh, play basketball, devote your life, do something with, with, the, with, the, uh, with the game of basketball. Okay, this kid initially, ah, maybe that's good. I want to get out from gangs and, you know, have a safe life. All of a sudden, these kids are not stupid. They are very, very insightful people. Very soon, soon I, um, after a couple of weeks, they will find out, actually, what's there for me? Zero money, very little exposure, not super fun uh, way of living because not cover no coverage, no famous people, no uh, social media. You're doing amazing thing being the only one, and I think you should be more some letters here, far more. And you should be fully professional doing much bigger business and five people working for you. So no social media, very weak. Um, uh, mainstream media, non-existent. Money is zero. And I see a friend of mine who stay in this gang. He already drives, you know, um, nice car. Two ma- next next month is buying Ferrari. Uh, you know what? But probably it's not said this basketball is not that attractive. We do not offer alter- uh, attractive and feasible and valuable alternative for these young young people. And we're not doing anything different than, than boxing can do, than other sports. We, we don't have a divine right to attract and show in the right path, send in the right path young people by virtue that they touch the basketball. They have to, they have to be some tangible, some sensible, measurable, uh, uh, think at the end of this road, clearly see, clearly map up, but both youngsters, people who look after them, people will not gravitate from uh, gangs or bad situation into situ- very kind of gray, unattractive, wishy-washy situation, which does not affect uh, their life in any, any significant form. Again, for the hundred times today, only strong, well-connected clubs can have a strong, very sensible conversation with young individual with, from the tribal background to, 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 to att- uh, 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 offer him something attractive. You don't uh, cure alcoholism by the visits twice a month at uh, uh, Alcoholic Anonymous. That should be consistent, everyday approach to see this guy needs to train every day. Maybe he needs to be in a situation when he can do his homework in the clubhouse or, or a club, uh, classroom owned by the club. He said, he, I have to have ammunition to say, look, uh, X, Y, Z, do this, 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 this. In Studiantes is interested in you. And that's on the knowledge. Know, knowledge is the power, because you said something important, that you said something which struck me, and I said, for the, you're right, because uh, I was all excited about this, this estudiantes, and you said, you know, Jack, probably average English kid doesn't know what estudiantes is, and I didn't take it as an offense, I felt like, Jesus, damn, he is right, but that's the core of the problem, we don't educate them enough, they don't know What's the end of the? We don't show them clearly the carrots and the end of why they should work hard. What they will get? Uh, where estudiantes get them, can get them? When God help us, when some English club can get them? We don't show them anything tangible, anything. And you operate, you very young, so, uh, You know the current um, young generation is very instant gratification situation. You need to show them something tangible. You, it's very difficult to, to bullshit them. It's very difficult to say something which is untrue because very quickly they see through it. That there must be something rock solid, tangible, to say, look, X, Y, Z, I need you to work four hours for me. Sometimes you will throw up, sometimes you will really hate me, but at the end of this road, there is something which makes your life significantly, significantly better. That's, I understand, true changes. If you show them something, something significant, something which they can clearly see and is attractive for them, that they will remove par- other parts of their life. They say, no, no, this is rubbish. I, I, I don't want to get stuck there. I don't want to deal with stuff. I, I, I just, yes, yes, 200,000 euro a year. On top, top of that, I'm super popular girls all over me and I want to be in Spain because we're playing in Malaga. The weather there is amazing. So something 
must be very, very, very sensible. Tangible. That I would understand that we offering offering uh, something, something, something uh, which is attractive and can make a real offer, uh, real, real, real change. For me, it's very similar. You know, I'm, sport is part of me. I, I love history and I love motorsport. I spend a lot of time traveling to 24 hour Le Mans and watch the classic and normal. And it's so almost like trying to someone get um, excited about uh, motorsport, which is expensive as hell. By saying, look, you know what, to start, we'll give you the second-hand Fiesta. Barely moves, but see how it is. And I make a couple laps, and I said, ah, the shit, it doesn't go fast. I, nah, I, I want to do something else. That's not attractive to me. So that's how we, that's how we trying to, 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 to play the social aspect of sport. And I disagree with that. That's, uh, I think, if we're doing that, let's do it properly. Let's do it properly. Offer them something which make them excited about that. And then they will dedicate their life to it. They will, they, they will be proper catalysts of changes. They, they themselves must believe. They themselves, if they believe themselves, the sport changes them and offers something for them, so money, better education, better social life, better everything, that's, that's, that's what we mm-hmm. you know, make a real difference. At this moment, I don't think basketball has got such a tool to provide that. Therefore, Let's not go over the top with the social things. Other sports can do it. I think we can do it much better. Perfect. That is a perfect place to leave it. Jack, it's been a huge pleasure. Thank you so much for imparting your knowledge with us today, uh, and I'm sure we'll speak again soon. It was a pleasure talking to you, sir. Thank you much.